biological information, mutation count, and synergistic epistasis. We've been talking about the book Biological Information New Perspectives, which uh, is edited by a number of intelligent design people and one person from the uh, um, self-organization group. Uh, <coughs> it's published by World uh, Scientific Publishing in 2013. It was a conference originally held in 2011 and it was supposed to be published a year later or less. And uh, uh, Springer Verlag, which is a well-respected textbook publisher, um, backed out of the deal about the time it started getting a lot of noise from other uh, what could be fairly called Darwin bots. Um, the material itself is actually found on the, uh, on the web. Um, they do sell the book itself. Uh, the book is expensive. Uh, no, if you're buying the hard copy, you're basically making a donation to the company. Uh, given the economic risk that they took, I think it's worthwhile if you have the money. Uh, but it's over $100. The book starts with a general introduction. It has information theory and biology, biological information and genetic theory, theoretical molecular biology, and then biological information and self-organizational complexity theory, which is the part that's not intelligent design. Um, and right now we're dealing with the part on biological information and genetic theory. We're looking at two papers. The first one, using numerical simulation to test the mutation count hypothesis, which is where we got mutation count from. And you'll notice that this is by Wesley Brewer, John Baumgartner, and John Sanford. And there's the information on how to reach them if you want to. Um, the second one is, can synergistic epistasis halt mutation accumulation? Results from numerical simulation. And it's by Brewer, Baumgartner, and Sanford, with the names reversed slightly. So the same three guys. And uh, this time, the corresponding author is uh, John Baumgartner and eventually I'm going to have to contact him and ask him a question. Um, I'm going to go through the abstracts, and then we're going to go into what the point of the two papers is. And they're actually related to each other, as you'll find out. There is now abundant evidence that the continuous accumulations of deleterious mutations within natural populations poses a major problem for neo-Darwinian theory. Statement of fact. It has been proposed that a viable evolutionary mechanism for halting the accumulation of deleterious mutations might arise if fitness depends primarily on an individual's mutation count. In this paper, the hypothetical mutation count mechanism is tested using numerical simulation to determine the viability of the hypothesis and to determine what biological factors affect the relative e efficacy of this mechanism. The um, mutation, let's see, yeah, the mutation count mechanism is shown to be very strong when given all the following unnatural conditions. All mutations have an equal effect, low environmental variance, and full truncation selection. Conversely, the MCM effect essentially disappears given any of the following natural conditions, asexual reproduction, or probability selection, or accumulating mutations having natural distribution of fitness effects covering several orders of magnitude. Realistic levels of environmental variance can also abolish or greatly diminish the MCM effect. Equal mutation effects when combined with partial select truncation, quasi-truncation, can create a moderate MCM effect, but this disappears in the presence of less uniform mutation effects and reasonable levels of environmental variance. MCM does not appear to occur under most biologically realistic conditions and so is not a generally applicable evolutionary mechanism. MCM is not generally capable of stopping deleterious mutation accumulation in most natural populations. 
That is to say, MCM fails most of the time. And in order to succeed, it needs to succeed all of the time. The process of deleterious mutation accumulation is influenced by numerous biological factors, including the way in which the accumulating mutations interact with one another. The phenomenon of negative mutation to mutation interaction is known as synergistic epistasis. It is widely believed that synergistic epistasis should enhance selective elimination of mutations and therefore diminish, thereby diminish the problem of genetic degeneration. We apply numerical simulation tests uh, to test this commonly expressed assertion. We find that under biologically realistic conditions, synergistic epistasis exerts little to no discernible influence on mutation accumulation and genetic de degeneration. When the synergistic effect is greatly exaggerated, so it actually makes a difference, mutation accumulation is not significantly affected, but genetic degeneration accelerates markedly. As the synergistic effect is exaggerated, still more degeneration becomes catastrophic and leads to rapid extinction. Even when conditions are optimized to enhance the SE effect, selective selection efficiency against deleterious mutation accumulation is not appreciably influenced. We also evaluated SA using parameters that resulted in extreme and artificially high selection e efficiency, truncation selection and perfect genotype, genotypic fitness heritability. Even under these conditions, synergistic epistasis causes accelerated degeneration and only minor reductions in the rate of mutation accumulation. <clears throat> when we included the effective linkage within chromosomal segments in our SE analysis, it made degeneration still worse and even interfered with the mutation elimination. Our results therefore strongly suggest that commonly held perceptions concerning the role of synergistic epistasis in halting mutation accumulation are not correct. Now, let's go back to the first paper. There's a significant body of literature based upon bo both logic and mathematical modeling which indicates that direct selection against the deleterious mutations is insufficient to halt the deleterious mutation accumulation. Recent studies using numerical simulation have demonstrated this point. The idea is the genome, by all theory, should be degenerating, should be getting worse. A primary reason for this paradoxical mutation accumulation problem is that most deleterious mutations have extremely small biological effects and thus are essentially invisible to selection. If you like, you could compare it to the rust on a car where a little tiny bit here doesn't really matter, a little tiny bit there doesn't really matter. But, you know, 20 years of it and uh, you've hollowed out the fenders completely. It has been argued that this fundamental problem might be resolved by a form of selection not based directly upon the biological effect of each mutation, but instead upon an individual's mutation count. How much rust is there? <clears throat> we term this the mutation count mechanism. In this paper, we use numerical simulation to explore whether the MCM can realistically be expected to stop mutation accumulation. In a companion paper, numerical simulation is also used to test a related concept, the synergistic epistasis hypothesis. So you can see these two papers are belong together. That more elaborate hypothesis also attempts to deal with the mutation accumulation problem by focusing selection specifically against high mutation count individuals. The concept of selection based upon mutation count was first put forward by Mueller but has been primarily developed and expanded by Crow. For decades, Crow, Mueller, and others have acknowledged that deleterious mutations should, be, should logically accumulate continuously in populations, creating an evolutionary paradox. By the way, Crow and Mueller are two really major names in uh, genomics. This is especially apparent when mutation rates are higher than one mutation per individual per generation. Even when mutation rates are well below one per individual per generation, Oda and others have shown that most mutations have such small biological effects that they are, must be nearly neutral, effectively neutral, and must routinely escape the influence of selection, leading to continuous accumulation. 
The problem of continuous accumulation of deleterious mutations creates an evolutionary paradox wherein populations should, be logically, should logically degenerate continuously, leading inevitably to extinction. The idea of selection based on an individual's mutation count was developed to address this theoretical problem of continuous de genetic degeneration. Concept is that when mutations accumulate to significant levels within a population, some individuals will have substantially more mutations than others due to random statistical fluctuations. If selection is strongly focused against those high mutation count individuals, elimination of single individuals might systematically eliminate proportionately more mutations and hopefully everything levels out. All this might be feasible if there were a strong correlation between mutation count and phenotypic fitness. As more mutations you have, the obviously the less fit you are. Given a strong correlation, the MCM might progressively slow mutation accumulation and eventually even stop it. In such a case, the mean mutation count per individual would increase up to a maximum and then plateau, and the mean fitness would cease its decline. We're trying to stop the apparently inevitable drift of a genetic entropy. Numerical simulations using biologically reasonable parameters have consistently failed to show any evidence of the MCM when using natural mutation distributions. This is most readily seen by plotting mean mutation count per individual over time. Using natural mutation distributions, wherein mutational effects vary over a wide range, the mutational count per individual consistently increases over time in a linear manner. This is seen even in given intense selection, large population, and many generations. In such experiments, no stabilization of mutation count is observed, and fitness declines continuously. This is because individuals are being selected based on phenotypic fitness, that is, what they look like, not what their genes are, as in nature, not based upon a contrived parameter such as an individual's mutation count, like uh, going through and counting all the mutations and saying, well, you have uh, 250 instead of 249, so we're going to kill you. Under realistic conditions, phenotypic fitness should have a weak correlation to mutation count within a natural population. Random sampling of gametes from within the same breeding population will have a strong statistical tendency towards producing similar mutation counts among all the progeny. Individual mutation counts will consistently track closely the population's mean mutation count. Not only will all individuals have approximately the same mutation count, the vast majority of the mutations within any individual will be nearly neutral. Any meaningful genetic differences between the individuals will be due to relatively few high-impact mutations, rather than the little ones, the big ones, like the fender's completely off. <coughs> These non-trivial mutations should, be, should strongly, strongly dominate the selection process, largely negating any correlation between an individual's mutation count and that individual's fitness. The correlation between an individual's mutation count and total fitness should logically be weak in most biological situations. This is exactly what is seen in careful numerical simulations. Deleterious mutations invariably increase continuously at a constant rate. The general direction is down, not up, as John Sanford said once here. Because the MCM hypothesis is a primary rationale for discounting pervasive genetic degeneration in nature. We desire to more carefully explore experimentally the potential for MCM using numerical simulation. For this purpose, we employed the numerical forward time population genetics program, Mendel's Accountant, which will also be used in the next experiment. We modified this program so that selection could be based directly upon a mutation's individual's mutation count not upon phenotypic fitness, which it would be normal. This was achieved by specifying that all deleterious mutations have exactly the same fitness effect. That, I that is, they're, they're given the exact same amount, and basically they total up everything instead of having some that are nearly neutral and some that are kind of obvious and then some that are just played out, flat out fatal. The result is that an individual's reduction in genotypic fitness can correlate perfectly with its deleterious mutation count. 
This provided us with a research tool for evaluating the potential of MCM and allowed us to study various factors that affect the efficacy of this mechanism. And I'm going to skip over, obviously, if I read all of both papers, why we would be here for a couple of hours. We don't want to do that. In these experiments, we sometimes use partial truncation, where selection was intermediate between full truncation selection and full probability selection. Mendel allows the user to specify the degree of partial truncation with 0.1 specifying 10% truncation and 90% probability selection, while 0.5 specifies 50% truncation and 50% probability selection. Uh, for, uh, for some of you, I should probably explain that probability selection means that if you have a certain uh, probability of having, uh, uh, if you have a certain fitness score, you should have proportionately more or less kids than somebody who had a different uh, score. It is not an absolute one zero, and that's the way you really expect it, that even people with relatively poor genomes will, will likely have maybe one kid instead of the usual uh, uh, let's say two, two and a half, three kids. Um, people with um, uh, people in, in truncation, what you do is you line everybody up according to a criterion and you say the bottom half of the class goes or the bottom third of the class goes or in our case, in this paper, it'll be the bottom two-thirds go. So you only keep one-third of the kids. And that's how you keep things from going bad, is that every time if you wipe out all of the kids that have more mutations, then, uh, uh, then by random uh, assortment, you will eventually start to slow down and then stop uh, the slow genetic drift down. When either tr truncation or partial truncation selection are employed in our simulations, we have seen that it can be result in unnaturally narrow genetic variants. And since we normally scale environmental variants to genetic variants to specify given her heritability, this can result in a population that has an unreasonably narrow range of phenotypic variants. For this reason, we established a non-scaling noise parameter where we can specify a minimal level of phenotypic variance by adding some non-scaling environmental variance to generate a reasonably heterogeneous phenotypic po population even under truncation selection. <clears throat> They're adding a minimum level of, of noise to the model instead of a level that's proportional to the number of mutations because the number of mutations turns out to be quite narrow. In this study, whenever we select a heritability value less than 1, we, see, we set the non-scaling noise at 0 0.005, creating a minimum standard deviations of 0 0.005 for phenotypic fitness. Just a, a little technical aside, we begin by modeling MCM using idealized conditions for optimum selection efficiency and then investigate MCM mutation count mechanism in more depth by introducing more and more elements of realism. So they're going to start and you'll see in the results we first examined the MCM using highly idealized conditions. We caused all mutations to affect fitness in an equally deleterious way. Each mutation when in homozygous form reduced fitness by uh, 0 0.001 that is to say each couple would have one thousandth less kids, which means you go from point uh, from two to one point nine nine nine. I know one point nine nine eight, which is you know basically not even noticeable relative to a fitness genotype with a fitness of one point zero. We. Combine the fitness effects of such mutations additively within the individuals. In this way, we created a perfect correlation between genotypic fitness reduction and the individual's mutation count. 
within applied zero environmental variation, everything is heredity. Such that phenotypic fitness and genotypic fitness were identical. So it didn't matter, you know, if there was a famine or, or, or uh, you wound up, uh, you know, getting your arm injured in battle. Uh, none of that kind of thing happened accidentally. Everything was due to the uh, heredity. We then applied artificial truncation. That's kill two thirds, the bottom two thirds of the class. Uh, wherein reproduction by a given individual depends exclusively upon whether its phenotypic fitness is greater than an arbitrary fitness threshold. And it's not actually an arbitrary fitness threshold. It's an arbitrary fitness threshold relative to the rest of the individuals around it. Under these highly artificial conditions, we found that MCM was indeed able to very effectively halt both mutation accumulation and fitness decline, as seen in Figure 1 which we'll show you in a minute. However, using all the same parameters, but suspending sexual recombination, as would apply to any asexual species, bacteria for example, uh, <coughs> completely abolished the MCM effect. Mutation accumulation and fitness decline were both perfectly linear without sexual recombination. Likewise, we found that using the original parameter settings and simply switching to probability selection instead of this truncation stuff. Essentially abolish the MCM effect. Except as the population approaches zero mean fitness or extinction, in which case there's a slight effect, but not very much. And here you can see the number of mutations. For perfect truncation selection, the idealized situation, it levels off at less than 200 mutations. And if it's asexual, it just keeps right on going. And if all you have is probability selection, you have an almost straight line with a little bit of a curve at the end, but not enough to get you out of uh, extinction. And the fitness declines in the same way it stays above 0.9 with idealized situations. If you're asexual, it just keeps right on trucking. And if you have probability selection, uh, it goes in a straight line until, again, it curves just a little bit off to the right, but that's not enough to save the organism. It will still go extinct in about 240 generations, more or less. In summary, figure one shows us that the MCM can be effective given equal mutation effects, zero environmental variance, and truncation selection. However, even with all mutation effects being equal, the MCM effect disappears whenever there is either asexual reproduction or probability selection. So the MCM is a very fragile thing in terms of how, how well it can uh, stop uh, the degeneration that's predicted. We next examine the effect of partial truncation and environmental variance. We repeated the idealized experiment as described above with all mutations being equal, but instead employed partial truncation we then did a series of runs where we studied the effect of environmental variance and that the runs go longer, 1,000 generations. Figure 2 shows that partial truncation set at 0 0.5 when combined with zero environmental variance still produced a delayed but still strong MCM effect. We then did experiments that added environmental variance when we combined partial truncation with a low level of environmental noise, fitness heritability 0 0.2, we saw that the MCM effect became somewhat weaker when we combined partial truncation with a high level of environmental noise. The fitness heritability is 0.02. That is to say the uh, environment has 50 times the influence that uh, heredity does on, on one's fitness. We saw that the MCM effect was greatly reduced, becoming insufficient to prevent extinction under those settings. And here's figure two, and you can see that, yes, you do get a leveling off. Um, and you, if you use a heritability of 0 0.2, you still get a leveling off. Uh, heritability 0 0.02 takes you off into extinction territory. The fitness drops 
It's interesting. Remember that uh, it was at 0 0.9 when we had absolute truncation. Now with partial truncation, it drops considerably. It still levels off. So maybe that's how you can keep uh, things together. Um, but that requires partial truncation, which means that part of the time you kill off the bottom half of the class, or the bottom two-thirds. We therefore wish to examine how a moderate amount of variation in mutation effects might influence the efficacy of MCM. What happens if your mutations are not all exactly the same, that some are more important than others? Instead of using entirely uniform mutation fitness effects, which we'd been using before, we truncated our normal Weibull distribution of mutation effects so that the smallest mutation effect reduced fitness one part in 100,000, 300 fold less than the Mendel default value. So now we've deliberately made the uh, uh, mutations of less, uh, of, of more of a spread than the original experiment called for, which is more realistic, actually. We then tested the four selection modes, full truncation, strong partial truncation, weak partial truncation, and probability selection. We let these experiments run 10,000 generations, introducing a modest amount of environmental variance. The results of these experiments are shown in figure three. And you'll notice that they, all of them just keep climbing up. So the mutations go well past 2,000, up to 3,000, and they're just uh, apparently heading off into the wild blue yonder. Well, why don't they draw them further? Well, it's very simple, because at this point, you get extinction. And you'll notice that full truncation, uh, this is one place where I added a couple arrows because the original is not totally clear, but if you look at carefully these uh, partial truncation, full truncation selection will still go to zero. Uh, probability selection will go to zero much faster and the two par partial truncation selections go to zero, but um, in an intermediate value between uh, full truncation and what you'd expect to be the norm, which is probability selection. Crow recognized that if the deleterious mutation rate approached even one per generation, selective removal would fail and then de-evolution would logically result. Trying to escape this problem, he went back to the logic of Mueller. To quote Crow, there is a way out, however. In stating his genetic death principle, Mueller stated for each mutation then a genetic death. Except insofar, that, by the way, you have to have that in order to keep things from degenerating except insofar as, by judicious choosing, several mutations may be picked off in the same victim. This is the idea. Oh, you have 300 mutations instead of our cutoff value of 250. Out. We keep all the people with above 250. And if you keep doing that, and you have absolutely perfect selection, you can actually maintain the genome. But if you put in anything like a reasonable genetic uh, model, it doesn't do enough. Thus, natural selection can indeed pick off se several mutations at once. This is the essence of mutation count mechanism, selecting away the highest mutation count individuals by judicious choosing. Remember, this is a blind watchmaker who doesn't, can't see, can't do anything like that, but somehow knows that 250 <laughs> mutations is greater than 249. <clears throat> Such that one death can remove more than one deleterious mutation. Our numerical simulations vividly illustrate the power of the MCM mechanism under ideal conditions. When all deleterious mutations have equal fitness effect, with no environmental variance, and with artificial truncation selection, 
Mutation accumulation can be halted in very few generations. Groh goes on to say, such an efficient way of removal of mutations at a small cost is strictly a consequence of sexual reproduction. The idea is that when you get genes from both parents, some people get out of uh, luck as to how many genes they have and you can take them out, out whereas other people will stay. Uh, they'll get lucky and, they'll, uh, and you can leave them in. An asexual species must either have a much lower mutation rate or suffer a large number of genetic deaths. Our numerical simulations also vividly confirm Crow's second assertion. Genetic degeneration progresses like clockwork when we model asexual species. Even gi given equal mutation effects, no environmental variance and full truncation selection. This means that the MCM mechanism is not generically applicable in the biological realm. It doesn't cover bacteria, it doesn't cover dandelions, there's a whole bunch of things it doesn't cover, and cannot be a generalized solution to the problem of mutation accumulation. Even given normal sexual recombination combined with uniform mutation effects and zero environmental noise, the MCM effect es essentially disappears given natural probability of selection. So if you don't have this very special kind of selection, you, it doesn't work either. It is widely understood that probability of selection is what is generally happening in nature. Truncation selection is the type of artificial selection employed consciously by plant and animal breeders and is not generally applicable to natural populations. Truncation selection seems to be primarily evoked for natural populations only when the MCM is deemed desirable. It's an artificial situation trying to save a theory. Although it is instructive to model uniform mutation effects on fitness, we know that mutation fitness effects are never uniform and are actually extremely variable in all living systems. Therefore, we tested how effective the MCM might be given a distribution of mutation effects in which was intermediate between a totally uniform fitness effect and a realistic distribution for higher organisms. Uh, we did this by doing experiments using a Weibull distribution of mutation effects having a higher than normal minimum fitness effect. So they basically, they compressed the Weibull distribution. <coughs> given this distribution, the mutations that were accumulating only ranged from 0 0.0 pardon me, 0 0.001 to 0 0.00001, uh, just one to two orders of magnitude. We found that even given this relatively narrow range of accumulating fitness effects, mutation accumulation and fitness decline could not be halted, even under full truncation selection. Some nonlinearity of mutation accumulation and fitness decline is evident early in these runs, but in all four experiments, these rates eventually became very linear. The selection mode merely affected the time to extinction. The model won't work. Again, skipping over a bunch of stuff. A possible objection to our methodology might involve the artificiality of designing certain nucleotides to be mutant. Since it might be argued from an evolutionary point of view that all nucleotides arose as mutations. This line of thinking would suggest that any hypothetical selection mechanism based on mutation count is inherently contrived and artificial. This objection is reasonable, however, it must be addressed to those who developed the MCM model in the first place. I don't like the way they handle that, actually, um, because it seems to me that the, the objection is not quite as reasonable as it sounds because the objection, what it's saying is, there is no fittest organism. There's no mutation either. Uh, that's right. The, a mutation of a mutation is just another mutation uh, that, that fitness has nothing to do with this. So well, once, you once you go down that road, you have no way of improving an organism. Moving on to the next paper, th and this will be a little shorter. There's a significant body of literature indicating that direct selection against deleterious mutations is insufficient to halt mutation accumulation. This has recently been validating using, using biologically realistic numerical simulations. That is to say, the MCM fails 
under ordinary circumstances. A primary reason for this result is that most deleterious mutations have extremely small effects on fitness and thus are invisible to selection. So how are we going to correct this? Some have argued that this fundamental issue might be resolved if selection is not ultimately based directly upon the biological effect of individual mutations acting in isolation of one another, but is instead based largely upon interaction between mutations, interactions that add to, to compound the biological effect of the individual mutations. Such effect in enhancing interaction between deleterious mutations has been termed synergistic epistasis, thus the title here. It is widely claimed that synergistic epistasis acts to slow deleterious mutation accumulation and therefore helps prevent genetic degeneration and mutational meltdown. We will refer to this concept as the SE hypothesis. And basically it, it works to try to turn probability selection into uh, truncation selection. Because the idea is that if you have each, prob each mutation, not only is bad in and of itself, but it also has bad interactions with other mutations. And so if you get 50 or 200 or whatever the number happens to be, the interactions between them become so great that the, uh, uh, that the organism dies. And so what you have is a kind of an artificial uh, truncation selection. The logic behind this hypothesis is somewhat counterintuitive. The reasoning is that while the number of mutations per individual increases in roughly a linear manner, the number of potential mutation-mutation interactions increases in a nonlinear fashion. Uh, the more you have, the worse it gets rapidly. The number of pairwise interactions increases as the square of the mutation count, for example. Um, it's actually n times n plus 1 over 2. Hence, if SE effects are significant, then at a certain point, individuals who carry the most mutations might conceivably begin to display a significant reduction in fitness relative to the rest of the population and hopefully be truncated. This in turn might increase selection against high mutation count individuals and thereby eliminate a larger total of mutations from the population that would, otherwise, that would occur otherwise. Eventually this intensifying selection against high mutation count individuals, if sufficiently strong, might stabilize the mutation count and thereby halt future genetic degeneration. This SE hypothesis is counterintuitive because in most circumstances, Increasing the negative effects of deleterious mutations on fitness only serves to increase the rate of fitness decline and hasten mutational meltdown and extinction. For the SE hypothesis to be viable, the selection against high mutation count individuals must be sufficiently strong so that at some point it is able to counter the associated increase in the rate of fitness decline. Interactions among mutations within a genome are diverse in their impact. Any two mutations may act independently of each other, that is, have no interaction, which leads to the standard additive model. Act multiplicatively, the multiplicative model, which diminishes each other's effect. In other words, you've already lost some, so you can't lose too much more. Um, <coughs> antagonistic epistasis or compound each other's effect, which is synergistic epistasis. You get 143 mutations, 144th one is a lot worse, and the 145th one is even worse. Undoubtedly, all of these types of interactions operate in any sizable genome. Therefore, it is not reasonable to assume all mutation-mutation interactions in any genome are exclusively of a single type. Nevertheless, non-interaction should be the norm with the other types of interaction being the exceptions. The only, rational, or the only rationale that they consider legitimate anyway for modeling a 100% multiplicative model or a model with SE contributions from 100% of the deleterious mutation interactions is to try to understand in which direction the exceptional interactions tend to pull the overall behavior away from the norm of additivity. 
We therefore conclude that a genetic model in which all mutations interact in a synergistic manner is an artificial model, one that does not represent any real bio biological population. The idea of genome-wide generic <coughs> SE interaction is virtually never invoked except as special pleading as a theoretical mechanism to halt mutation accumulation and degeneration. In other words, this isn't biologically reasonable. Most people know it, uh, especially the people who are trained in it. And uh, they're actually trying to explain why evolution could possibly work, why it wouldn't just fold in on itself due to uh, genetic entropy. The present study uses numerical stimulation to show that even if there were widespread in generic SE, it still could not halt mutation accumulation. Instead, what is seen is that as SE effects become stronger, there's more and more gen genetic degeneration, just as logic and common sense would suggest. Instead of saving your population, you're going to kill it faster. <coughs> Modeling synergistic epistasis, and we're, gonna, we're skipping over quite a bit. Um, Mendel has also been designed, however, to handle the special type of reinforcing interaction between mutations known as synergistic epistasis. Like multiplicative interactions, SEA interaction must be viewed as a deviation from the general rule of non-interaction, that is, the additive model. SEA interaction implies that as deleterious mutations accumulate, each additional mutation has a greater and greater effect on fitness. This is the exact antithesis of multiplicative interaction where each deleterious mutation has a less and less effect on fitness as you keep adding them. Both multiplicative and SE interaction represent deviations from the additive model, but they pull in opposite directions. To the extent that multiplicative and SE interactions occur at a similar frequency, they should largely cancel each other. Viewing the genome as a whole, if 90% of all mutations combine additively, and 5% combine multiplicatively, and 5% percent combined via SE, the result should be that the two types of deviation mostly cancel, yielding results nearly equivalent to a purely additive model. For most genetic simulations, a realistic and practical choice is simply to use a standard additive model. Again, we're using this because somebody says it might work, not because it makes realistic genetic sense. And again, skipping a whole bunch of stuff. We ran a number of experiments with Mendel's accountants to ascertain a reasonable value for linking the, the link scaling factor alpha relative to the non-linked factor beta. Uh, beta. Those are just two parameters to say how much interaction do you have between the various uh, uh, between the various. Uh, uh, li linked uh, mutations. A larger beta means that you have more interaction and things go downhill faster with each mutation. And a larger alpha the same way. One is for non-linked factors and the other is for linked factors. This implies much larger, pardon me, we consider cases with just under 200 total linkage blocks for the diploid genome or about 100 for the haploid genome. This implies much larger linkage blocks and more linked mutations than observations would suggest for, this organi for most organisms. Now, if the chromosome were the only unit, it would be 23, but there's apparently quite a bit of crossover that happens uh, from different chromosomes in different, uh, at different times with different people, different meioses. So uh, there's a lot of blocks that, that can get crossover. 2,000 is probably a low estimate. And moving on to the next comment, <clears throat> large SE effects and modest selection pressure. We, our, we begin our exploration of the SE effects and the fitness of SE scaling factors, alpha and beta, that are large but with the selection pressure controlled by fertility relatively low. For a low level of selection pressure, we chose a fertility 1.1, which for a constant population size means that only 10% of the offspring in each generation do not reproduce. That's basically 2.2 kids per woman. Um, 
For SE scaling parameters, we chose 10 for the non-linked mutation pairs and 2 times 10 to the fourth for the linked mutation pairs, or 2,000 times the non-linked scaling factor beta. These parameter choices are about 100 times the maximum value we consider to be biologically realistic. So when they did this, they are already off the scale. What we found was that the effects on fitness after 2,000 generations were too small to quantify. So SE doesn't really do anything. Even the mean fitness due to normal mutations had decreased by 33%. Typically, we found that the mean number of accumulated mutations after 2,000 generations was about 0.7% smaller with this level of SE relative to no SE. Despite the small effect on fitness, these values of 10 for beta and 2 times 10 to the fourth for alpha, are still likely far higher than is realistic for most pop natural populations. In other words, using very large numbers, it didn't make any difference. Nevertheless, these experiments prompted us to explore what larger values for alpha and beta, further off from what you'd expect, might reveal concerning SE behavior. So. Let's consider cases with the same low selection intensity, but with beta equals 300 and alpha equals 6 times 10 to the fifth. Both 30 times larger than before. Figure 1 displays the mutation accumulation and population fitness histories for the following four cases. No SE effects at all. SE effects from non-linked interactions only. SE effects from both linked and non-linked interactions. And SE effects from both linked and non-linked interactions, but with scaling factors doubled. And here's basically the same line. There's maybe about a 2% difference between those two. But you see, since the epistasis means that uh, more mutations is dramatically worse fitness, the fitness is even weirder. That is, with no SE effects, you're getting this kind of a leveling off here. With SE effects, the fitness is coming down, and if you increase this, the fitness effect drops to extinction fairly rapidly. But, but question. Um, just a minute. Yes. Isn't synergistic epistasis supposed to help evolution? Yes. And what they're pointing out is that most of the time it makes no difference. But if it does make a difference, it actually makes the fitness worse. Oops. Oops. Uh, in our next set of experiments, we increased the selection pressure to a moderately high level. Instead of a fertility of 1.1, we went to a fertility of 2.0. That means four kids per woman. This means that twice as many offspring are produced each generation than are allowed to, than are allowed to reproduce in the succeeding generations, so that you kill off half of the population each time, with hopefully the bottom half. That is, the selection process excludes half the offspring in each generation from reproducing in the next. For SE scaling factors, we use 10 to the fifth. That's uh, my mistake for not putting that up. And uh, for non-linked interactions, and 2 times 10 to the 8th for linked interactions. That should be up uh, again. And then examine a case with both scaling factors increased. Um, figure 2 displays the mutation uh, accumulation and the population fitness histories. And here you can see that compared with no SE effects, there is less mutation happening, but it's pretty linear, and it's just a matter of time before it gets up there. But the effects of the mutations are quite dramatically greater. That is, here's where your effects are here. And, and if you add SE effects, the more SE effects you add, the more of a, a drop off you get. And the primary reason that SE is of interest today is because it has been invoked as a mechanism that might possibly be able to halt mutation accumulation. This SE hypothesis, as we refer to it, has been embraced and advocated by several population geneticists.
but it has never been generally demonstrated to work. In fact, the hypothesis is notice, noticeably, notably counterintuitive. In a non-selective setting, SE logically must accelerate degener genetic degeneration and lessen the time to extinction, which is what we're seeing. This is because as de deleterious mutations accumulate, SE guarantees that on average, each, each new mutation must have a greater and greater deleterious effect. And skipping a whole bunch of stuff. A very recent paper by Crow forcefully argues against any significant role for epistasis in affecting selective selection e efficacy, efficiency. This would seem highly significant because the same author has for decades been a leading proponent for theoretical mechanisms that might resolve the mutational degeneration paradox, including the MCM and SE hypotheses. Crow now states, my main objective here is to show that the breeder's practice of ignoring epistasis and quantitative selection is fully justified. It doesn't really matter. In general, the smaller effects, the more nearly additive they are. Experimental evidence for this is abundant. That is to say, this isn't just his opinion. There's lots of experiments that argue in the same direction. Multiple factors with individually small effects acting in a near additive manner seem to be the rule. SE doesn't exist or exist so minimally as to be not worth worrying about. Although there may be large dominance in epistatic components, selection acts only on the additive variants. For these reasons, one would expect that epistatic variants would have only a small effect on predicting the progress of selection. Any attempt to include epistatic terms in prediction formula is likely to do more harm than good. That's Crow. Given that the SE hypothesis has so many glaring problems, one might ask how it ever became widely accepted. The SE hypothesis seems to have been proposed solely as a possible means for dealing with one <coughs> of the as yet unsolved difficulties for the classic neo-Darwinian model. It appears to have become widely accepted only because there is no alternative mechanism, no alternative mechanism could be identified that could conceivably stop deleterious mutation accumulation. Genetic entropy rules, and they're trying desperately to get around it. We suggest that until a more credible mechanism can be discovered for halting deleterious mutation accumulation, the de genetic degeneration problem should be most honestly be described simply as a paradox that is yet to be explained. And uh, my take on all this, mutation count mechanism, MCM, requires truncation, which is totally unnatural selection. That is to say, the top half, top third, actually, of the class survives. Synergistic epistasis is an attempt to force truncation so that MCM can work. And I don't think it works. In the real world, these mechanisms aren't adequate. They work so badly that one defense is to deny that there's a standard from which some organisms deviate. Uh, once you go that route, well, you, no, you have no positive selection either. In that case, what is the driving force behind evolution? Now, I do have one small problem with the second paper. It appears that most of the models used before had a reproductive rate of six per couple, whereas this paper used 1.1 or two, which I think actually translates to 2.2 or four per couple. The rationale for such a small number it used in the SC paper is not clear. I would have rather that they'd used, um, well, three, which would have been six per couple. Losses that count against reproductive rates in real life include failure of fertilization, miscarriage, and infant and adolescent mortality. And so it is entirely reasonable that uh, you have six kids for a couple and only two of them survive, especially in an era of high infant mortality. With that exception, and I'd like to see the numbers redone uh, with, the, with the standard six per couple, 
I think that the point is clear. If there are enough mutations and they are overwhelmingly deleterious, then only unnatural selection can save the genome. The standard reply to that is, you don't understand evolutionary biology. My own comeback is, you don't understand that evolutionary biology doesn't model life accurately. But that's my opinion. <coughs> now it's your turn. Uh. Yeah, you're on. Uh, just one, one interesting comment. Uh, uh, I can recall an article that came out by Crew way back, I think, in 2001. And uh, it was commented on in uh, Scientific American. And uh, Crow's uh, data showed that, uh, you know, it, it's impossible. The genome should have degenerated a long time ago. Is that the one, why are we not dead a hundred times over? Uh, possibly, I am uh, not that. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the interesting comment in Scientific America, we should have degenerated a long time ago, but why worry? And the implication right after that was, why worry? We have survived several hundred thousand years, therefore, uh, don't worry about this thing that we're degenerating so fast. Which is, of course, uh, put in the uh, idea of we've been here a long time, way ahead of uh, what the data was saying, that we have not been there around, around that long. Well, that's true. Uh, and, and this is the last desperate attempt, or the latest desperate attempt, to try to explain why we could still be here. Um, it looks like uh, genetic entropy is just more powerful than any of the proposed mechanisms to try to somehow save the genome anyway. But I think we get to this discussion of the simple fact here. We're trying to save the genome here. Folks, we're supposed to be evolving. We're supposed to be getting better. It's a whole different story there. We can't even keep them degenerating. If you're, if you're in a river that has a current of 10 miles per hour, um, and you can swim five miles an hour upstream, there are two things that can be said. Number one, you didn't get there by swimming upstream. And number two, if you wait long enough, you're going to go downstream. And this is, the, this is the problem that they're trying to avoid, is that in fact, things are degenerating. We can show that. And you know, it's, it's fascinating that, that the attempt to say, well, they're really not degenerating because there really isn't any standard by which to measure anything. What happens to fitness then? I mean, that makes fitness less than a tautology. It makes it a totally meaningless datum. If they had used the number three in that uh, second uh, article, their degeneration rates might have been even faster and approached extin extinction at a much faster rate. It might have. Uh, it might have slowed it down a little bit. And, and that's the question. That's, uh, I would prefer to have, have been using apples and apples to do a straight across comparison. It's the one criticism I would make of that one paper is that they, they appear to have chosen uh, a lower rate of reproduction without really justifying it. But uh, no, they're by the exact same three authors. Uh, different order of the authors, but uh, they're, they're the exact same three authors. So 
uh, which I, I felt was a, a mythological uh, flaw in the way that they, they did it. Uh, actually, it's interesting because I, I, should, I should write to Baumgartner and ask him about that because uh, it would be very interesting to see, did they run it with the other numbers? Uh, can they run it with the other numbers? I mean, the, the computer program is still up there, presumably. If you knew what you were doing, you could just punch in the numbers and see what you got. But the, the numbers they use are not that far off from, from actuality. Well, four isn't that bad. That means uh, that half of the kids die. Yeah. And, uh, and in, a, uh, in, a, in societies that we have right now, that's actually not a bad estimate. And if you use three, it means out of, well, you use two-thirds of your children. Yeah. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that abortions count, or miscarriages count for children. Yeah. That is to say, if you have a miscarriage, mm -hmm. it's a kid that didn't make it. Mm -hmm. So, And, it, and the, my understanding is that the known miscarriage rate is somewhere around 25% of live births. So you can figure that one of those kids, uh, one of four kids, actually had so much genetic degeneration most of the time when they examine fetuses. Uh, the statistics I was given was over 90 percent of the time when you have a uh, miscarriage uh, that there's something seriously wrong with the embryo. Too many chromosomes, too few chromosomes, missing enzyme, Something like that, where it just simply couldn't make it. 65% of the first pregnancy terminates in miscarriage. And um, it's because of chromosomal problems. See, um, they could not possibly survive outside the uterus. Uh, that, that implies that uh, six kids per woman is actually not a bad selection. From your presentation this morning, it seems that uh, vegan. Adventists would be the best uh, argument in favor of uh, evolutionists, you know, that survival of the fittest. Uh, yes. Um, I'm not sure too many people want to go there, but <laughs> that is true. If you're looking for survival of the fittest and you want to be, uh, you want to use the Adventist lifestyle, and it's pretty hard to motivate the Adventist lifestyle without Adventist theology. Which, which means that we are evolutionary selected not for truth, if evolution is true, but for, uh, uh, but for beliefs that are helpful in survival. But once you do that, then, uh, then, 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 how, then how do we know that they're selected for truth? Yeah, but isn't that survival fitness? It is survival. Just interestingly, uh, about two weeks ago, I happened to be looking at uh, BBC News, and they had a note there. I don't know if any of you saw it or not. About uh, the place to live long is in Loma Linda, uh, and they uh, they quoted several of our uh, people associated with our uh, health longevity study, and so on. Point said, you know. They're, Males would live 10 years longer, which we all know you have to put a lot of qualifiers to get that one to work. Uh, but we do live longer, uh, uh, and so on. And they attributed it, uh, as I recall, to uh, three things. One was uh, uh, no tobacco uh, out in alcohol, that lifestyle, uh, nutrition, uh, and no meat, and faith. Yes. The third one was a, a belief in God. They put that right in there. Actually, uh, so National Geographic had a 2007, I think, November issue. Or something like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, so just moving into Loma Linda isn't going to work. You, gotta, <laughs> uh, you have to believe like those crazy people. <laughs> so you mean to say we need work, huh? not only faith. <laughs> Yeah, well, McDonald's moved to Loma Linda. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, we have a Starbucks right across the... Yeah, I don't know what's, what that means. 
mean, are we going down or are they coming up? Well, I don't know. Do they serve veggie burgers? Yeah, I'm a veggie burger, yes. Okay, there you go. They're moving up. A grilled veggie burger. Ah, that's the problem is in the grill, you <laughs> see it so. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> We're not now the question is, can now. you get a whole wheat bun with that yeah, veggie burger? Yeah, there you are. <laughs> yes. yes uh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I, if, I, if I understand the, the, the papers correctly, what they're basically saying is that there isn't a reasonable mechanism to stop genetic entropy. And if genetic entropy is true, then the idea that species live for millions of years without divine help fails. Which means that either God had to support the dinosaurs along the way because they lived for so long, or else uh, they didn't live that long. So either one of those alternatives will not get you into a mechanistic evolution. You've got God interfering some way or another all the way across. One other thing was the dinosaurs might not have lived that long ago also. Oh, yeah. So we've, we've covered that on a number of occasions. The carbon-14 dating, the blood, the uh, osteocytes, tissue, all of those kinds of things, how they would last for millions of years was certainly not clear and in fact was not anticipated until somebody looked at the dinosaurs who was too stupid to realize that they couldn't have anything in them. <laughs> well, the dinosaurs are not known for large brains. Uh, yes, yes. Anyway, next week come back for I think something entirely fresh and new, design detection. Uh, if you want to, if you want to get a head start on it before uh, you get the email, you can Google uh, game design detection, and you know, I think you'll be, or, yeah, you'll be able to find it on the internet. Otherwise, uh, wait till the link comes through. You can you can look directly at it. Um, uh, it's part of a fascinating discussion, and it's very interesting to watch people try to deny that you can look at something and tell it's designed. But uh, we'll see you next week.